Make sure you guys hit the subscribe button if you guys are enjoying the content that we're throwing up. And uh, make sure you guys hit the like button if you enjoy the video. And yeah, let's begin. Okay, so you guys are gonna have to bear with me for a second. It might be a little bit echoey in here and I'll try my best to reduce it, but I'm actually working on my sound recording space at the moment, so we gotta make do. <laughs> but we are covering Powers of X. Those of you guys who are following me on Twitter, you guys know that I was taking a break for this week, but I'm doing Powers of X because I love House of Powers of X. Now, where House of X covers the 10th life of Moore McTaggart, basically, Powers of X covers a 10, like not really a 10 year window, a uh, covers three different time periods, right? So the point at which the X-Men were being formed, or at least when Xavier was trying to bring the team together, before it really officially formed. And then the second era is basically the modern day. And then the third era is in the future. Now, one thing we've never actually done here is we haven't actually established a chronological time period of when this takes place, right? I mean, for the sake of the story, Hickman's just using a general period of time, like between this point and this point is basically when everything takes place. That way he's not really forced to narrow things down and force it into a chronological period because then it would all kind of go to pieces later on down the line. Marvel also kind of makes an editorial mandate. As far as I'm aware, you can't really ascribe dates to comics otherwise it actually puts a solidified date on them uh whereas you can simply just say it takes place somewhere maybe around the modern day who knows and just kind of call it a day which is what they really do now charles xavier served in the korean war which lasted loosely between 1950 and 1953 right i mean it's give or take you know a few months here and there in terms of the beginning and the end but we can usually say at, at some point in 1953 is basically when it came to an end and then from there we basically have what's around a maybe an 11 year window not really an 11 year window probably a a nine year eight or nine year window between the time the korean war ended and the time xavier started the x-men now before hickman started writing the writing the comics as they exist now the explanation that marvel gave us in terms of why xavier started the x-men in the first place was because of the fact that he met amal farouk he met the shadow king and it was his first introduction into a mutant that was literally just malevolent right it was just an evil entity that existed out there and didn't want to do anything but inflict harm on people and realizing that that, that was you know that, that it would make no sense to simply assume it was the only one and drawing the logical conclusion that there's other mutants out there that would try to pursue the same goal right world domination or just inflicting harm or whatever xavier launched the X-Men. And so what we're looking at here is sometime during this eight-year window between 1953-54, running all the way up to around 1961-62, so we probably say around nine years, uh, when the X-Men were basically introduced in Marvel Comics, right? Or at least when the team was officially formed, right? Because when the comic first picked up, the team had already been formed. So we can we can kind of say somewhere along those lines, and this eight-year window is when all this takes place. But what this does, you know, where it says X-Men Zero, X-Men Year One, uh, this basically picks up with them going to visit Bar Sinister. Now again, this is Hickman referencing his own work. Bar Sinister was given to us as part of Secret Wars, right? When you had like a uh, battle world and you had the, the realm where Sinister hung out, his base of operations more or less, it was called Bar Sinister. So it was kind of cool to see because what you also get here are all these different versions of Sinister himself. Now, this is something Jonathan Hickman does not explain. Those of you guys who read Secret Wars and who read Avengers and New Avengers can hearken back to this, but the only real conclusion we can draw from this is that either these are clones that Sinister made of himself or they're the alternate reality counterparts who have just been here ever since. Now, you have these different versions of himself and then you have the actual Nathaniel Essex who seems to be the one sitting here. This is kind of a big moment here and this is kind of a big thing because what Hickman does is change up pretty much everything we know about Nathaniel Essex and he says that he has a mutant gene. This is wholly new territory. This is Jonathan Hickman shifting things up entirely. But for Sinister himself, a little bit of backstory here and, and you guys will find a, a link in the description for Mr. Sinister Explained, which again is part of our X-Men playlist, our X-Men encyclopedia. To basically sum this up, Sinister used to be called a guy named Nathaniel Essex and the idea was that he was, he was obsessed with genealogy, right? He was obsessed with the idea that somewhere along the line that, that humans were going to give way to people with abilities, right? So it was basically the concept of mutants, but not really knowing what it was. It was simply just a theory that he had. But because of the fact that the villain Apocalypse didn't really even know what he was, and then overheard the theories of Sinister, and then was basically told, you're a mutant, right? You're the next stage in human evolution. In response, the question was asked, do you want to be able to do this kind of stuff forever? And when the answer was yes, then you ended up having Apocalypse, who uses technology to transform Nathaniel Essex into Mr. Sinister, right? So up until this point, this particular comic right now, the form and function of Sinister's powers is that they were bestowed on him by external means, by, you know, Apocalypse using celestial technology to modify the genes of Nathaniel Essex. What Hickman is doing here is saying, no, that basically uh, either he's going to reconcile the two and say that what Apocalypse did was wake up the mutant gene of Nathaniel Essex, or he's going to come back and he's going to say that never happened. But them basically meeting with Sinister is interesting here because Xavier shows up and he basically says, we know that what you're doing right 
right now, it's going through and cataloging the world's DNA, right? That's what Sinister does. He looks at the entire world's population and says, who's of particular interest here? Basically, it's, it's Professor X and Magneto simply saying, we know that you catalog mutant genes and even just human genes to a degree. We know that you're a collector. These are things that are of interest to you. So what we want to do here is we want to work with you. We basically want to bring you the entire catalog of the mutant genealogy as we discover it. You will be the one who will, who will catalog it. You'll hold on to it. You'll examine it. You can do whatever you want with it. Just don't destroy the genes and don't, you know, do anything like nefarious, you know, don't like clone people or anything, which is what he did with Jean Grey. <laughs> He made Madeline Pryor, but uh, but the fact remains, you know, they're like, basically, you're going to be the database management for the entirety of the X-Men population, or at least the, the mutant population. And where this version of Sinister basically shuts it down and says, why would I want to work with any of you on, on, on this particular thing? He's basically killed from behind and we're met with the real Nathaniel Essex. Now, this is kind of like a big change in terms of Nathaniel Essex as we know him, because he's kind of depicted more as like, a, well, there's really no better way to say it. Um, He's sassy. <laughs> <laughs> That's basically what he is. You know, like, it's me, Mr. Sinister. <laughs> I'm fabulous. Uh, it's, it's it's kind of what it seems like, you know, and I think it's kind of cool, actually. I think it's kind of interesting, but it's, it's a pretty cool thing because what this does is this sets the stage that where we previously looked at all the X-Men stories that came before Powers and House of X, and we saw Mr. Sinister as a guy who was collecting the DNA of mutants by using subterfuge, right? Like doing it in a very, very sneaky way in a very underhanded way, basically doing what he was not supposed to do. What we're finding out here is that Xavier basically sent him on that path. And then this has all been happening at the hands of Xavier, which is again, a pretty cool concept and so what this does is this switches over to uh to doug ramsey and it switches over to xavier and basically xavier kind of again setting in motion all the things that are going on right now with the establishment of krakoa as being a mutant haven now up until this point um and this is kind of an interesting thing here because when when this happens and we basically get you know a few a, a few months ago when we speed up to what's basically a few months before the events of of the modern day picked up with regards to to house and powers of x we end up finding that xavier traveled back to krakoa now krakoa had had always kind of been an enemy island more or less of the x-men and so far that it was a it was a giant size x-men story right like this story where they all kind of came together and they had to save the x-men from krakoa and all that kind of good stuff one of the cool things that hickman does about this is he actually says it's not really what we think it is right in the sense that krakoa is there but it's not really a malevolent island it's not an evil place it's an island that's there and it, it never really had any true contact or at least in, in its present form never really seemed to have any true contact with beings that were out there and was really more curious than anything else and so what he basically does is he brings cipher along for the purpose of being able to understand Krakoa. And the reason why this matters is because where Xavier can tap into Krakoa and Xavier can understand the more empathetic tendencies, right? In the sense of what Krakoa is feeling and, and how it's perceiving things, Doug Ramsey, again, as a mutant that can basically speak any language, can essentially understand the language of Krakoa as it talks and then turn it and, you know, create an alphabet more or less and then pass that on in, in the form of Xavier absorbing it and then setting it up so every mutant can understand. It. That's really kind of how all that worked. That basically the way this played out is in the modern day the various x-men who want to escape human persecution more or less who want to go to a safe place will go to krakoa but the question was always asked if krakoa speaks a language that nobody on earth understands then how do they understand it this is where that begins that is douglas ramsey sitting down it's douglas ramsey learning to understand the language having a full-on conversation spending about a year you know, to really grasp how it is that krakoa talks you know it's like learning french or spanish or something like that and then in turn what xavier does is he takes that information and he copies it out of the mind of of doug ramsey and and then from there, the various telepaths stationed around Krakoa install that language, for lack of a better word, into the mind of new mutants so they understand exactly what it is to Krakoa is saying and how the island functions. It's a pretty cool thing here. Now from there, it jumps into the origin of Krakoa itself in terms of, of what Krakoa was before it became the landmass that it is now. But what we're told here is that at some point in the past, there was simply just a land called Okara. And the way it's described here by Hickman is a little interesting, uh, but also a little strange at the same time, right? Because this land is described as being ancient before the word existed, but not old in the way that, you know, that that they were old, that like the, the world itself is old, meaning that this island existed, but like either it was artificially created or it rose up somewhere along the line. I would say this chunk of landmass probably rose up sometime during the Great Cataclysm, right? When the Celestial showed up during the second host, they wiped out most of the uh, Deviants, they sunk Atlantis, that somehow this popped up in the process, right? It's the only real way to make it make sense. And the reason why that why I say that is 
because somewhere along the line, this landmass of Okara was split in half and it became Arako and Krakoa. And from this giant rift, more or less, between these, these two chunks of land, uh, came these massive demons, right? This Twilight Sword basically came with them. Now, the Twilight Sword is interesting because on one hand, it kind of looks like the All Black Necro Sword, but it's not. So we know this is not Null the God Word. I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Null the, the Symbiote God, right? And then my thought was, well, if it's being called the Twilight Sword, then maybe it's the Twilight Sword of Surtur. The issue is that the Twilight Sword of Surtur looks a little bit different. The reality here is we're not given an explicit explanation what these guys are. All we're told is that these demons, these monsters more or less, showed up out of this rift, and then ultimately they were fought by the Apocalypse. And this is why I say this takes place probably somewhere around 4,000 4, to 4,500 years ago, right? Because Apocalypse was born 5,000 years before the, the modern day, and he didn't rise to prominence until around maybe 100 years after that, after everything that took place in Egypt, right? So maybe around 4,900 years ago is when this may or may not take place, right? So we've got an almost 5,000 year window between when this happened, right? So if we scale it down and go by what we're being told, maybe anywhere between four to, I'm sorry, five to 4,000 years before the modern day. But regardless, it took place a long time ago. <laughs> And we don't really know what these beings are. And in fact, all we're really told here is that by virtue of Apocalypse defeating these forces and then casting them back down into the cavern and then cutting off that entire section of Krakoa from itself, that Krakoa's kind of been half an island ever since. And it always will be forever, right? It's not, it doesn't really seem to be super important at the moment, but that's the nature of Jonathan Hickman writing. He gives you something that seems pretty innocuous, right? It's just a thing that's there. And then suddenly it becomes super important in like 20 issues, right? So that's one of these reasons why when you're going out and buying and you're reading these stories, you have to pay attention to everything. Ultimately, what ends up happening here is, is Douglas Ramsey stays, on, stays on, on Krakoa for about a year and then basically goes through the process of understanding how it all works. And so what we do to this point is we jump to the future and we talk about this concept of, of basically ascension. Now remember, from what we saw in the last, uh, the last issue, ascension is basically like this sort of final step for those individuals who are essentially robots, right? Like the idea is that when a robot's created, you know, with a baseline sentinel is really where Hickman starts from. You go from a baseline sentinel which is given a command and the command is basically eliminate mutants now it follows that command to the best of its ability and it's given a little bit of leeway there right insofar as like a sentinel would look at a mutant and say okay mutants are the enemy but mutants stem from humans because of the next step in human evolution therefore all mutants have the potential to become mutants and so all humans are enemies like that's the kind of conclusion that a that a sentinel would draw right but only insofar as the command that it's given right it wouldn't say like your job is to take care of like all all mutants like a, a sentinel wouldn't look at that and extrapolate and say okay because there's there's humans then there's humanoids we should also take out humanoids no it's confined to that line of programming beyond that you go into master mold which is given a little bit more of 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 leeway in terms of sentinels in terms of how it creates them as well as like getting up and leaving and going to a safe place if it's in danger but it's still continually following the program of my job is to create sentinels then you go into a mother mold which is a little more intelligent then you go into a nimrod which is artificial intelligence and then you go into what are basically humans that are bonded with nanites and become like the perfect sort of sentinel. But the issue with this, and this is one of the things that Hickman kind of points out here, is that this ascendancy that's currently taking place right now, this landscape in, you know, a thousand years in the future, what we found out in the last video is that these aren't humans and they're not mutants. That humans and mutants have essentially been wiped out or pushed to the brink of extinction. Mutants, for the most part, seem to be gone almost entirely. What's left of them exists way out there in the far reaches of space as part of the Shi'ar Empire. Those who are left on Earth, and there's, there's probably around eight or nine of them, they're the only ones really left in this part of the universe. Uh, from there, you, you you basically look at humans, and what we were told here is that humans kind of exist in small little encampments, but they're more fleeing for their lives and trying not to be caught. That what you have now, basically running the show, are these human and, and robot hybrids, right? These, these sort of perfect beings, these Omega Sentinels, more or less, is what they're called, that exist out there. The issue they're running into here is that when the Phalanx show up and they're trying to reach ascendancy, the goal of the Phalanx is to basically look around at all machine concepts, right? Like all robots who have achieved a higher level of artificial intelligence that basically allows them to transcend their programming and even transcend humanity, right? To think far beyond the means of a normal human, but to also somewhat function as humans and then absorb them into themselves if they're far enough along, if they're of interest, right? That's basically what it is. The issue with this is that they're not fully robotic. And so one of the ways they're trying to get around that, and this is kind of where this, this comic ends, one of the ways they're trying to get around that is they're actually trying to essentially take their consciousness and then put it inside a computer shell. And then when that's done, the phalanx will see that computer shell and then say, okay, like we will absorb absorb that because as far as the phalanx are aware, this is a being 
something that's achieved, or I guess a machine that's achieved a higher level of thinking. That really seems to be what's going on here. But again, this is classic Hickman, right? You get this little bit of information and then it's done. And then that's, that's basically it. And then it wraps up. And it's a cool little moment here because the question is, are beings actually going to achieve a higher level of ascension? Is this really the fate of humanity? That humans and mutants are essentially going to be wiped out and they're going to be replaced by robot biological being hybrids. This is kind of an important thing here because if you go back and you look at Hickman's Avengers and New Avengers, and I know I keep saying that, everything from his Fantastic Four all the way up until now is all one giant cohesive story, right? And so when you look at that, you say, okay, you have the, the, the portion of the story where Captain America and Black Widow and Hawkeye and I think somebody else, I can't remember, get flung into the future. And along the way, they basically start dropping off, but you get 50,000 years into the future and you basically end up realizing that like the Avengers transcend the earth and become this universal protection force, right? So like there's a future there, but how do you get from point A to point B and will that future come to fruition? That's really the, what's being presented to us here by Jonathan Hickman. And that's really the question that we have to ask. But with that being said, guys, we're gonna bring this video to an end. If you guys are new here to Comments Explained, make sure you guys hit the sub button to become part of the Rob Corps. If you guys enjoyed this video, make sure you drop a like and I will catch you all later. Peace.